So let us pray. Holy One, we thank you for each other. Thank you for the love and the friendship that we share. Thank you for the technology that allows us to be together even during this time of pandemic. Above all, thank you for your abiding presence and all the ways that you reveal yourself to us as we spend this time tonight thinking about meditating on your presence and our experience of your presence. Let your Holy Spirit move and give us all that we need to grow closer to your heart of love. Amen. <clears throat> so, two weeks ago, you allowed me to uh, share with you a picture of my elementary school, William L. Cabell Elementary. So, please bear with me one more time while I send you, show you two brief pictures from my past. So, this is St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Worcester, Massachusetts. This was the first place that I served as rector, and it was in this church that I was serving when um, the search community from Church of Our Savior came and swooped me off my feet and eventually brought me to Charlottesville. But it was in this church very early on in my tenure, and it was as I stood in front of this altar in the aisle, I was preaching, and uh, I was feeling good about it. I was going on, and I was feeling... I was feeling pumped. Uh, I was in the aisle. I had no notes. And I got to this really important part of my sermon. And I completely forgot what I was going to say. I mean, my mind went blank. And I stood there silent for what was probably 10 seconds. But when you're standing in front of a congregation, speechless, it feels like eternity. And I... I stumbled, I apologized, I, I, I lost my train of thought, I'm sorry, and, and I, tried to, I tried to pull myself together, and uh, I eventually came out and, and said a few more sentences of some sort or another to kind of bring things to a close, and I went, and I sat in that chair right there, and I felt utterly embarrassed. I mean, actually, that's not a strong enough term. I felt mortified. And in that moment, I, I had no sense of God at all. But two things happened afterwards that sort of opened me up a bit. One was right at the end of the service. You know, most people were, you know, they're very kind. And they, they made no comments. They, you know, there was no snide marks, nothing like that. But this one woman came out at the end, and she was, she had tears in her eyes. She'd been crying. And she said, you said something today that I needed to hear. Thank you so much. And I was, I was kind of blown away by that. And then about a week later, I was meeting with a clergy group that I had joined. And I, I shared this experience and how awful I felt. <clears throat> and one of the priests looked at me and said, that is so awesome. You probably did more to advance the kingdom of God by completely screwing up that sermon than you would have if you delivered a perfectly executed piece of oratory. And when he said that, something clicked in me. And it was as if God was saying, listen to this. It's not about you. It's not about how good you are, how perfect you can deliver a sermon. It's about me and the way my power can work through you and through anyone. It was a God moment for me at a time when, really, I didn't expect to experience any kind of God moment at all. I don't know about you, but I didn't grow up primed to failure. I grew up primed for success. Uh, my parents didn't drive me hard, but I drove myself, and I had to be perfect. I needed to be the best student. I needed to make the best grades. I needed to be perfect in school, and I needed to be perfect in religion, which means I needed to be perfect in my praying. I needed to be perfect in my understanding of God, blah, blah, blah. I was obnoxious. Uh, and so, the idea of any failure, of any falling short, was for me just kind of catastrophic. It took years and years, and many experiences like that one I had at St. Luke's, for my consciousness to slowly change and for the spirit to finally knock me over the head and get me where I really need to be. 
And I share that personal story with you um, because the topic tonight lends itself to personal stories, and that is how do we experience God when we fall short? It's not actually a very surprising topic if you think about it because the Bible is filled with people who fall short. I mean, dramatically short. Abraham and Moses and David and Solomon and the 12 disciples and the Apostle Paul and 2,000 years of fallible, flawed Christians. We, we all fall short. And yet, there is this sense of experiencing God, not in spite of that, but right in the midst of that. So it really does behoove us to spend some time thinking about what is it like to experience God when we do fall short, whether it's because of illness or physical or emotional limitations, or we just plain screw up and we fail. What does that look like? How can we expect to experience God in the midst of that? And today, I, you know, I, I I'm not going to pretend to be totally exhaustive in my presentation, but there are four areas that I think are really primary for us to understand how we might do this and how God actually does touch us in just those moments. The first one we've talked about a little bit in preceding weeks, and that is forgiveness, which is the very heart of the gospel and what Jesus offers over and over again. And of course, the only people who receive forgiveness are the people who know they need it, which is really striking in the Gospels, the, the number of people like Pharisees who resist the very idea of it, and it's the broken people, the hurting people, the marginalized people who get it, and they receive that forgiveness. God offers it to everyone. Christ offers it to everyone. But there needs to be a certain openness to experience that. You know, every week when we uh, have our worship, you know, the priest pronounces absolution. But sometimes it really hits home in a way we need. Uh, you know, there is sacramental confession in the Episcopal Church, the Sacrament of Reconciliation. And the rule of thumb about it is that all may, none must, and some should. And the ones who should are not the ones who've done terrible things. The ones who should are the ones who can't seem to experience that level of God's forgiveness because God wants us to know forgiveness. It really, everything hinges on that because we are imperfect and because we will fail. So being open to really having that liberating sense of experiences is, is really important. In my office at church, I've had some incredible God-filled moments doing confession with somebody and having that person just feel lifted uh, light, unburdened, because they are feeling a level of forgiveness they've not felt before. And I have also experienced that myself. So I know how truly liberating that can be. So one very important way that we experience God when we fall short is in the experience of God's forgiveness. The second area is Redemption. What does it mean to redeem something? Or to redeem is to really to buy back. It's to, in biblical terms, it's to take something that is bad and to make it good. As simple as that. Something is redeemed when, when it's brought from a place of, of awfulness to a place of goodness. And that, of course, is what God does all the time. I mean, the cross is just the primary example of God you know, taking something really awful and turning it into something really good. But God does that in our lives. Have you ever experienced um, something that you did that was really wrong, hurtful at the time, and then later on, you see there was a blessing in it? I hear about this a lot from people. People will describe failed relationships, uh, terrible first marriages, uh, things that they've done in their past that they really, really feel badly about, and will tell me that, you know, actually, these years later, they're grateful for it because they learned something about themselves or because it opened their heart in a way that had not been opened before. Or there was some way 
that God redeemed what at the time felt awful, but in the fullness of time became a source of blessing. I mean, have you ever experienced that? I mean, looking back, uh, and most of us have been around the block a few times, uh, we've made mistakes and we've, you know, made poor choices. And I can certainly think of mistakes and poor choices I've made that actually rebounded to my good um, because they, they led me to a place that I would not have gotten to otherwise. And, and I see very much the hand of God in that. Uh, and that is an important way that we experience God, given how fallible and flawed we are, is in this power of God to redeem, the power of redemption. The third area, extremely important, and that is power through weakness. Now, <laughs> we don't like to be weak. You know, we're a society, we're all for winners. We're all for strong people. We all want to be the ones who can beat other people, stand firm on our own feet, be independent, be strong in every possible way. We don't like weakness, which is one of the reasons why we struggle with the real gospel, because it's all about weakness. You know, the power of God is made manifest in Christ most completely on the cross when he is at his weakest. And as much as we can intellectually say that in the creed and everywhere else, we have a hard time believing that. That's why I love the Apostle Paul, because Paul is such a weak person in many ways. Uh, he talks famously about his thorn in the flesh, and we don't know what that thorn in the flesh was. But we do know that Paul asked it to be removed. And I'm glad we don't know, because it could be anything. It could have been, some people speculated eye condition, some people think he had a stutter, uh, it could have been a temptation you couldn't get rid of. It could have been a besetting sin, a bad habit. It could have been any of those things. What we know is that God doesn't take it away. And when Paul prays about it, which he says he prays about it three different times, uh, God says to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness is precisely because Paul is weak that God can work so fully through him. Think about that. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God actually can work through you when you are at your weakest? Because that's the message. It's not that we don't have strengths, and it's not that God can't use the things that we do really well, because of course God can. But so often, it's through our weakness that God moves. I mean, Paul recognizes this. He says, we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power comes from God, not from us. Some of the most God-filled moments I've had in my ministry have been moments when I've been the most useless, often sitting at the bedside of someone who's dying including, in too many occasions, a child that's dying. And there's heartbreak, and there's pain, and people are crying, and yes, I can offer prayer, but I can't do a damn thing to fix it. I sit there, and I hold their hands, and I listen to their cries, and I feel the pain with them, and that's all I can do. And yet, so often, that's when I have a sense of God's grace just moving. And, you know, uh, I get cards from people and letters from time to time. Uh, occasionally, they're about a sermon I preached. But mostly, it's about, remember that time when my husband was dying and you were there with me? And I remember that as a time of complete weakness and failure. I could do nothing. But that's exactly where God so often works. It's amazing, actually, to recall. Uh, many of you remember Jennifer Durant. She was the associate rector here, died, uh, well, almost six years ago in February, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> so Jennifer was an Enneagram 8, which means she was a fighter. She was strong. She hated being weak. And then she got laid low by ALS, which is a nightmare disease for anybody. But for her, it was the ultimate nightmare. But one of the extraordinary things that happened as she sat in that wheelchair and really just basically wasted away was that it was because she was so weak and so vulnerable 
that she was able to touch so many lives. And some of the most powerful pastoral connections she had didn't happen in spite of ALS in the wheelchair. It happened because of ALS in the wheelchair. This is, this is the way God is. Talk to people in a 12-step program. Addicts who have lost the battle with addiction, they can't beat it. They can't fight it. They've tried. They struggled. They give up. That, in fact, is the beginning of the 12 steps, to admit that their lives are unmanageable and to realize in that moment of weakness, that's where God can be found. Uh, I, yeah, I've heard some amazing stories from recovering addicts about their experience of God's power working through their weakness. <clears throat> it takes some honesty and some humility to ask yourself, where have you experienced God in your own weakness? Finally, <clears throat> the fourth area where I think we experience God when we fall short, and what is the most important, is to actually know unconditional love. It's so easy to say that. Unconditional love. And it can be so hard to actually feel it. So hard to experience it. But over and over again, the gospel show us Jesus loving everybody the way they are. He hangs out with tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners. He doesn't tolerate them. He loves them. He enjoys being with them. And the Gospels don't say that they stop being tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners. It just says that God loves them in the midst of that. God loves us not when we're perfect, not when we have our act together, not when we're just really at the top of our game and just, you know, just hitting on all the cylinders. God loves us always, always. Even and especially when we're flawed, we're weak, we're sinful, we're fallible. I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that that is the single most important way I've experienced God as an adult. And it's taken years and years and years of all sorts of painful experiences for me to be open enough to know the unconditional love of God. That's the the starting place of everything, the foundation of our whole faith is God loving us just the way we are. And to experience that, to really know it to the depths of our being and to realize it's not because we're so great. It's not because we're successful. It's not because we do everything right. It's just because we are, we exist. That is why God loves us. And if we can get that right, if we can experience that, it changes everything, everything. So let me share my screen with you again um, and just refresh. So, um, so these are experiencing God when we fall short. So we have forgiveness, redemption, power through weakness, unconditional love. Again, I'm not pretending that these are all exhaustive, but I think they cover a lot of ground in this. And um, uh, for me, at least, they're, they're helpful, helpful words and phrases to think about this whole topic with. So we're going to have some discussion in a few minutes. Uh, and I'm going to give you four questions. Now, the questions are necessarily personal <laughs> um, because we're talking about something personal. No one has to answer them, of course, or answer them out loud, but I hope that you will at least think about them and to the degree that you're comfortable that you'll share answers with your group. Because that's one way that we can help each other and one way that we can um, you know, be vulnerable and uh, let the spirit move. So the questions that I have for you are these. First, have you ever struggled to feel forgiven? How has God helped you to experience forgiveness? Two, have you ever seen God redeem a bad choice or a mistake you made? Three, 
Describe a time when you felt God work through weakness, either through you or through others. Four, do you believe that God loves you unconditionally? Where do you need to experience that love more fully? So I am going to give you five full minutes to think about that. I'm going to keep these questions up on the screen. You can take a picture of them if you want or write them down, whatever. Um, and I'm going to give you five minutes uh, just to, to think a bit. And then we'll divide you up into groups and we'll have some time for discussion. <laughs> 